One of the really important uh, phenomena that I emphasize in a lot of my work is the importance of experience on molding the nervous system into its adult form um, and why what children learn uh, it has a long-lasting effect on them. This would suggest, that kind of thinking, that one should be looking at how networks change, brain networks change, how the wiring diagram of the brain is affected by development. What is happening when a child is very young and doesn't know anything? How does the wiring diagram look compared to once a kid's brain is filled with facts? How does it change? And I think if you don't know much about this field, and I ask you, what do you think a baby who doesn't know anything's brain is filled with? You might say, well, it doesn't yet have a lot of connections. It's not wired up yet. Whereas once you learn a lot, then your brain would be very complicated and filled with wires. And so my laboratory and others have looked at young brains to see what does the wiring diagram look like in young brains. And uh, the place where we can look easiest actually is not the brain at all, but it's the connections between cells in the spinal cord called motor neurons and muscle fibers. It's part of the nervous system because the muscle fibers are caused to contract by signals that come out the axons of neurons that send processes into muscle, but it's a very easy place to look because there's nothing else out there. There's not a lot of wires, there's only the wires coming from the spinal cord. And when we began looking at this, we were surprised to see exactly the opposite of what you would have expected. At the time, a young mouse is not yet a good walker in its first week of life, when it's just kind of crawling around but not walking yet. The wiring diagram of the muscle is not less complicated than the adult wiring diagram, it's much more complicated. Whereas each adult muscle fiber in a muscle, a muscle might have a thousand muscle fibers, has only one nerve that talks to each muscle fiber, and there are many nerves coming in, but each muscle fiber is only contacted by one of them. We found in these baby animals that there were 10 or more different axons of different neurons converging on each muscle fiber. And instead of an axon that might talk in the adult to 20 muscle fibers, we found axons that were talking to 200 muscle fibers. So in babies, you had axons that were contacting many more target cells than they ultimately do, and you had target cells that were receiving convergent information from many more axons than they ultimately ended up with. That is, the baby was hyperwired compared to the adult, not less wired. And then over the course of development, synapses are eliminated to leave each neuromuscular junction singly innervated. By metaphor, this may be what's going on in the brains of children as well, of young animals. The brains start out wired up for all possible contingencies. And then experience somehow causes the pruning away of all but a very small percentage of what could have been there that life is basically a choice of what you become based on your experiences. And once you've pruned away other ways of thinking and experiencing the world, you become more narrow in, in your worldview. And that's why my children, when they look at me, often remind me how much of a dinosaur I am, how, how many new technologies are not that interesting to me. And I remember feeling the same thing about my parents. Even though I think I'm an open-minded person, compared to my children, I'm, I've become narrow-minded. There's a, a well-known expression, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, certainly, we talk about old people as being set in their ways, as if they've become more uh, less flexible about what they think. I think this is part of that learning process. That is what learning may be, choosing a way to think about the world. And so these mechanisms, these developmental mechanisms, are important because they probably have a lot to do with what we become. So we've been studying that in many parts of the brain, but the place where we've made the most progress by, sh by far is in the neuromuscular junction, where you can actually see these axons converging on a target cell, and then in a living mouse that's anesthetized, you can take a picture, you can sew up the wound, looking at this muscle and come back later and find the very same synapse and take another picture of it. 
sew up the wound and come back a few days later and take another picture and watch the process of going from multiple axons converging to one staying and the others go away. And it turns out this is a competition. Axons are fighting each other for the right to dominate a target cell. They're all, they all want to be there, but somebody always wins and everyone else loses. And so we've been watching that process uh, in living animals. We now know that there are these big reorganizations in muscle, and we have begun to make some progress in showing very similar kinds of things are going on on certain kinds of neurons. But the, the big question is, how would you use a mechanism like that to generate a skill or a memory? It's not just the loss of connections, it is the ones that stay must somehow be organized into something that you can remember as, that's my grandmother, or that's a Coke can, or something. How, how, what does that look like? And those, those things we don't yet know, and these are going to require a, a wide range of different tools than what presently exist. To watch events like this in living animals have, it has been difficult because um, nerve cells are invisible. They're not stained with anything normally. So we've had to come up with ways of seeing things that are normally not visible. Uh, they're clear, and yet we have to give them color. And so we've worked on a number of technologies that cause cells to make uh, proteins that are fluorescent that let us see them, and the fluorescent colors can be more than one color. So you might, for example, see a yellow axon and a blue axon converging on the same target cell in the same place, and then watch over time as they flip-flop in the amount of territory they have until finally one takes over the territory and the other leaves. So that is what we, it is within our capability now, and we have been able to do this kind of work. The challenge is moving forward is can we use these kinds of approaches to watch these events in the central nervous system where one is learning not simply which muscle fiber to contract, but one is learning how to ride a bicycle or what your grandmother looks like or whatever. I mean, how do you use tools that let you see uh, axons there. And the problem is you've got a lot more axons and a lot more target cells, and they're squished together in such a dense way that it's very hard to see the, f the individual leaves on the trees because it's a gigantic forest where there's ev everywhere you look, there's stuff. There's no free space. Everything is filled up. So we've been working on a, a wide range of tools <clears throat> that allow us to see more clearly what's going on in the central nervous system. One is uh, to use more than two colors, uh, to come up with techniques that generate uh, maybe even thousands of colors. These are mice we call rainbow mice because there's this rainbow of colors in individual cells which allow us to disambiguate many different axons and dendrites at the same time. And the other is tools to slice brains so thin that in any one section it's unambiguous what we're seeing and then look at slice after slice after slice after slice after slice. And so we're doing that as well. And we're cutting brains automatically with these very thin slices and imaging them. And we are using these brainbow tools to look at wiring diagrams. I sometimes think about the future of this field of what, if you extrapolate the kind of work we're doing presently, what could, what could be the goal? I, what, would, what would happen in 10, 20 years from now if we looked at this kind of approach? The aim here is to figure out how the nervous system sculpts itself based on experience. And so what you would ultimately like is to have a, the equivalent of what is called the central dogma in molecular biology, which is a well understood pathway between DNA to RNA to protein, you would like to have a similar pathway in the nervous system between experience, a physical wiring diagram, and then the output of a memory that is based on the experience. That somehow the experience generated a wiring diagram, and the wiring diagram can play out a memory of that experience. That's what you would like. And that central dogma does not exist yet. We don't know what the shape 
of a neural circuit is that has been shaped by a particular experience. But if you had access to every single axon and every single synapse and every single target cell, and you knew the experience that was modifying them, perhaps one would be able to get this particular alternative central dogma, which is a, a very essential part of human evolution. As I said, we do not have just genetic evolution of our brain. We have cultural evolution of our brain using this second dogmatic system of experience instantiating itself in the physicality of brains.